Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Radical Candor Podcast. I'm Kim Scott. I'm Jason Rosoff. I'm Amy Sandler. In the past, we've talked about how to know whether or not being a manager is right for you. And we've also talked a lot about manager burnout. Today, we're exploring the question, what if nobody wants to be a manager at all? Vizier, a leader in people analytics, surveyed a thousand individual contributors about whether they wanted to become people managers. Almost two thirds, 64% said, thanks, but no thanks. There was a TikTok video from a user named Kia Abdul, and I hope I got that name right, with over 2 million views. And in that TikTok, they were equating management with an unpaid internship due to all the responsibilities that managers aren't compensated for. There was another TikTok where another user said that she stopped being a manager in tech because there was no work-life balance. She had zero decision-making power and felt that companies didn't care about their people as much as they did about the bottom line. So that is what we're going to be talking about today. Just a little bit more data. This Vizier survey, they found that employee ambition was primarily outside the workplace. The top three priorities, and just think about it for yourself, does this resonate? The top three priorities, spending time with family and friends, two thirds of folks put that as their uh, top three priority, being physically or mentally healthy, 64%, and traveling, 58%. Kim, Jason, any guess on where people manager came in on uh, on those numbers? <laughs> I, I bet it was number eleven. Oh, you're so good at reading the notes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, being a C-suite executive in this list of twelve came in uh, <laughs> dead last. So the question we're talking about today is. Kim and Jason, can we have a world without managers? No, we cannot. Uh, and <laughs> I, I think, like uh, so many things were popping in my mind as you were as as you were describing these TikTok videos in particular. And I think if you become a manager for money, that is the wrong reason to become a manager. Uh, um, I mean, I think. Uh, a, professor of mine at business school used to ask, Richard Tedlow used to ask, do you want to do the things that managers do or do you want to be a manager? And the right reason is to do the things that managers do. Um, I think also on that, on that uh, Vizier survey, like work is also like good work, work that you love is to me when I put that ahead of travel <laughs> in my mm. list of things. I wouldn't always because uh, often I hated my job, but like once now, now I would put, you know, work uh, as number three right behind time with loved ones and physical slash mental health. Um, like mm-hmm. when, and, and the other thing about work, I don't know why I was, I was spent all day, both days this weekend weeding which is work that I love to do. And therefore I love my yard. It does not compensate. (laughs) I don't get paid Mm. for that work, but it, it, and there's a line in part of darkness about, about what's his name is working on his boat. And there's a line in there where it says he did enough work on the boat that he loved the work. I think work and love are actually connected. Um, And so anyway, That's not really a way of answering your question. Well, it is. It's a really interesting way because I think even, you know, what we may have heard from Professor Tedlow, you know, going back to this survey, the question of, you know, why individual contributors don't want to become people managers, 91% were citing some kind of barrier. And the top reasons that were deterring ICs from wanting to be people managers expectations for increased stress and pressure, 40%. The prospect of working longer, more hours uh, was was 39%. The third one was that people were happy with their current role. And then the fourth one was a lack of interest in leadership responsibilities. That was about 30%. And so I think as I reflect on that and what you're talking about, the work itself you know, maybe if we ask them about weeding, we might get a different like response, but the actual work of being a manager does not seem 
seems like a lot of stress and pressure, um, the proverbial juice not being worth the squeeze, at least from some of what we're seeing with these, I'd say, TikToks and data. Yeah. I mean, I think if you don't, if you're not interested in doing the things that managers do, if you do, if, if the idea of having a one-on-one with someone and asking them about their life, if the idea of having career conversations and trying to understand what motivates people and how you can help them take a step in the direction of their dreams, if those things sound uninteresting to you, then you should not absolutely should not become a manager. I think I've told this story before, but, you know, play it again, Sam. I'm going to tell it again. Uh, so so th- there was a moment when I was working at Apple, teaching, managing at Apple, and we always tried to have these inspirational leaders come in and, and, and kick off the class. And there were a lot of inspirational leaders at, at Apple. And one time, but I never knew who they were. Like, I don't know who found these folks and <laughs> brought them in to kick off the class. That I, but I met them usually as I walked in the door. So I'm about to teach this day and a half long seminar. And this guy walks in and he stands in front of the class I'm about to teach. And he said, well, you all, I have made a deal with Apple. They do not ask me to manage people. And I continue to work here. <laughs> I was like, that is not really the inspiring note I was hoping to <laughs> But it was very honest. I actually, I was able to do something with that. I was like, look, if you all don't want to manage people, you should not, you can have a successful career at this company, uh, as we just saw with whatever his name was, who was super successful. He made a ton of money at Apple, but he did not manage people because he had no interest in managing people. Um, so that's the, one of the things that was bringing to mind as we were talking, Amy. Emotional labor has always been part of being a manager because what, you know, what you said, Kim, was like talking to people about their lives and their goals and like all of that stuff is true and it's a big part of what being a manager is. But there's also like assigning uh, work and making yeah. sure that people, hold, that you're holding people accountable to the things that they've agreed to do or rather that you're, you know, you're inspiring them to follow through on the commitments that they've made yeah. um, is like the positive way to say it. But I think in the last five years in particular, that like the emotional labor has taken on a different tone. Like the, there's so much yes. like collective trauma from the pandemic and um, uh, the, 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 like the, the refocus, the, at least in the U.S., the refocus on the, you know, the fight for social justice and equality, like the emotional labor has, has notched up um, in, in a significant way. And it, and it often has, it, it has something to do with helping people continue to enjoy their work. But I, I was talking to a friend of mine who is an incredibly talented uh, product manager uh, and someone who it was like w- one of my favorite people to work with. And she basically said that between the pandemic and having a kid, she has lost the ability to think critically about any time horizon beyond a year. Yeah. Like, yeah. like she can't think about it anymore. Like she's sort of like, Do, am I going to have a house in six months? Is like that, that's the level of like plant future planning that she's doing. And I think that's why a lot of people are elevating these other things like travel and spending time with loved ones and all this other stuff because, you know, the, we're, we're still, the nerve is still pretty raw. You know, people are still living with uh, the reality that, you know, it's not, the future is not guaranteed. And so some of yeah. that, I feel like some of the inspirational, like part of leadership uh, and people management has been replaced by, by like supporting people in their like trauma response to, to like losing a sense of like where they're going in their future. I, I, and I, I would guess that that is very obvious to the people being managed. You know what I'm saying? They know what they're saying in their one-on-ones. They know what those conversations are like. And so they're like, do I want to deal with me on a regular basis? Like, no, that's someone else's job. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. And I think, you know, the, a lot of great leadership training comes out of the military. And in the military, obviously, people, I mean, trauma is inherent in the job. Uh, 
if you're, especially if you're in a combat situation. And I think that the, the, mili- the leadership training in the military has always been, you know, you take care of your people and your people take care of, of the work. <laughs> you know, like your job as a leader is first and foremost to take care not only of people, but people and their families. And I, I, so I don't think this is new per se. I mean, trauma is not new. There's been trauma for, I mean, I think maybe our willingness to talk about trauma is maybe a little bit new, but people have been traumatized always, forever. 100% agree. But I think people are, that it's not new. You are correct. Yeah. But I think there's a changed expectation as to who, as to a manager's responsibility mm-hmm. in helping an individual contributor manage that, like manage yes. their, 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 yeah. their, 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 their like, lives. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. I, I think th- yeah. there was a piece in a, a, a Reddit thread um, in career guidance, and I'm just going to read it because I think it might uh, flesh out, Jason, what you were sharing with your own reflections. It says, quote, being a manager is the most lonely role I've ever had. Like you get shit from both directions and you don't really have peers to complain to. You just kind of have to deal with it all on your own. And not sure if this is just my company, but a lot of the stuff I hate is what I have very little control over. Strategy gets set by my manager, salary and policies by HR. I just get to communicate this lovely stuff backwards and forwards. The bit I like is the stuff around building a great team and coaching people, but the negatives outweigh the positives 90% of the time. I think that's very well said for the problem of being a middle manager. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the, when you're a middle manager, you own decisions that you weren't necessarily involved in making and that you may disagree with vehemently. And I think it's really important to think about how to deal with that and to, and to be very explicit about how to deal with it. And I think the most important thing you can do when you're in that situation of having to communicate a decision that you disagree with to a team of people who know you well enough, they're, they're going to be able to tell that you disagree. And, but it doesn't do any good to say, yeah, this is stupid, but we have to do it anyway. Like that's not <laughs> inspiring for anyone, mm-hmm. although it may be tempting. I think the thing you want to do is you want to, before communicating the decision, you want to go to your boss and ask some questions. Like you want to try to understand the rationale behind this decision, even if, which still doesn't mean you have to d- to agree with it. But if you take the extra time to try to broaden your perspective, because very often when when a decision gets made, it gets made by people who have who have who are taking twelve things into account. Whereas you're taking one thing, you know, your team's thing into account. And so it may not make any sense from where you sit, but when you try to understand the broader picture, even though you still disagree with it, you may be able to at least acknowledge these other points. And I think that can be Mm -hmm. very helpful, both in terms of communicating with your team, but also in terms of growing in your career and trying to understand your boss's point of view and, and and a different perspective. That's like that's great guidance. What as you were talking, what it made me think is like it's almost the same guidance as like get what do you do when you get feedback you disagree with, which is like you yes. have to find the part that you do agree with and and fo- yeah. focus on that. Like that's that's the way to move forward. Um, we don't want to reject out of hand something just because we don't we don't agree with with part of it. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know just Kim, you're calling out the piece about middle management is a really important one there was a piece in in Fortune and they were sharing some research around how roughly two thirds of leaders reported having more responsibilities at work now than they did pre-pandemic, which was shared by a third of individual contributors. And so this increase in responsibilities has led to an increase in anxiety and it shares how middle managers calling them, you know, an organization's shock absorbers are in a particularly difficult spot because they they lack the senior leadership's you know access to support and re- resources and they have to enforce these policies they may not endorse. So I just wanted to kind of reinforce this role of you know where middle managers sit, but also going back, Jason, to what you were saying about kind of where we were before the pandemic and now that you know not only having the the actual emotional trauma and physical trauma that people have navigated, but also there's people that have far more responsibilities than they may have had. Um, 
three, four years ago. I, I, w- I was going to say, I, I think the part of what happened is, is that companies were like, we don't know what to do with this. We're not going to provide mental health benefits. We're not going to provide you additional resources. We know people have these problems. Manager, deal with it. Like, that's what happened to the majority of managers in the pandemic. They're just basically told, like, we know all these things happen. We're not going to spend any more money on resources or help for you. And you just have to deal with it. So th- I think, like, e- even though it might not be sort of on paper an increase in responsibility, I think there might have been an increase in frequency of having to sort of perform some of the responsibilities of being a manager without any additional support. My theory, what, what I'm positing, and it seems to be backed up by the data, is that people are meeting, they're, they're meeting employees in some state of crisis. Forget trauma, just like some state yeah. of crisis more frequently on a, like yeah. on a more regular basis yeah. right now than they did 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and it might actually be the case that we're meeting the same number of people in about the same level of crisis, but people are more willing to reveal that they're in some state of crisis at work. So it might be the case that this yeah. was always the case. People are just uncomfortable talking about it. So you could say yeah. like societally, you know, maybe net net, it's an improvement. But from the perspective of a manager who's like, how many times a day do I have to put on like my crisis management hat? Yeah. I think they're picking that hat up and putting it on a lot more frequently than they, yeah. than they at least they perceive they were in the past. Uh, yeah. and, and so, and, and I think that, there's a fixed number of hours and energy is a, is a, is a sort of, is a depletable resource. And yeah. so when you say, hey, it's your job, and then you're also like, but it's also your job to do the goal setting. To make the pricing the, decision. Yeah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, that's also your job. That's how you wind up with a stack of plates that's like way bigger than you can possibly clean in, your, in a shift. Like, yeah. And so every day you come in and there's a stack of dirty plates on your desk. And you're like, okay, I'm going to try to get through my stack of dirty plates. But there's no yes. time at which you get to the bottom of the stack. I think that's how a lot of managers feel. I think a lot of individual contributors feel the same way. But at least in this data, it's at a slightly lower, like it's a lower mm-hmm. percentage of the overall population than managers. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You know, so I think as we try to give some guidance to to the group, there was a, an entrepreneur.com piece uh, where Vizier CEO Ryan Wong shared Quote, one important step is to redefine the meaning of manager. Partly this is about reconceptualizing the role. The tech industry, for instance, has popularized player coaches. So these are employees who continue to contribute as individuals while also leading small teams of trusted colleagues. While this balance can be challenging to strike, the upside is sustained engagement with your field and growth of new management skills, end quote. So I'm curious, you know, Kim, Jason, do you see, is there a need for companies to start to maybe separate out some of these parts of a manager's role? What do you, what do you think is a path forward to make being a manager more attractive? I think explaining to people what managers do uh, and being very clear about it uh, is, is important. Like managers should be soliciting feedback before they give it. They should be giving praise. They should be giving a certain amount of criticism in these impromptu conversations. They should be having career conversations. They should, like, just spelling out what managers do. I think another metaphor is not going to solve the problem. (laughs) Uh, I think, I mean, I like the idea. I don't know that this is a metaphor. It sounds to me like they're, they're actually trying to maybe even separate out the coaching part with the responsibility part. When I see player coaches, that's how I interpret it. I don't know, Jason, do you read it differently? Here, here's the, the problem with that sentence. It, it, is, uh, uh, it, it is the part that reads, small teams of trusted colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my experience with the tech industry's embracing of player coaches is that, they, is that they're like, you're going to be a player coach and we're going to give you the same size team as we used to give people who were only people managers. So you're still going to get a team of 10 or 12 or 15 people that you're responsible for, but you're also going to have individual contributor responsibilities and strategy Mm. responsibilities and communication responsibilities (laughs) and HR responsibilities. Like, And now we're back into the TikTok where this is an unpaid (laughs) internship. Right. And you still won't be able to buy a house or afford to pay off your student loans. (laughs) 
Sorry yes. to interject. I don't have my mic, good microphone, but, but no, no, you're yeah. exactly right, Brandy. I, I think if middle <laughs> if middle management is the step that people have to take, and there are certain and like there are certain unavoidable things about being a middle manager. I think that emotional labor is unavoidable. You should embrace it. You should look forward to it. It should be part of what gets you excited. Is like I'm going to help this team be as uh, be, be sort of like happy and functional as they possibly can to achieve our goals and maybe take a step into the direction of their dreams. Like the emotional label part, you have to be excited for. But like the unavoidable parts of like communicating decisions that other people make, those that's just unavoidable. The unavoidable part of like having to, uh, to assign work that you know that is not the thing that people are most excited about, unavoidable part of work. I don't think it is unavoidable that people must be player coaches. I think there's possibility, at least in my mind, that you could have a role that's primarily focused on people management. It doesn't mean that you never touch a project again. But I do think this idea that you know uh, you treat managers as half an individual contributor and half a coach or half a player and half a coach, I, I feel like that that idea is just like dead on arrival. Uh, because one or the other of those things is going to be significantly undermined by the company's inability to to like properly assess how much a single human being can possibly do in both of those roles. There might be a company, and Vizier might be the, the one, where they actually, you know, I could see a player coach, if you have a team of three or a team of four, and like you've worked with them for a long time, and you truly mm-hmm. have an individual contributor role, could work. But that's not my experience. Like most companies don't actually... That's not how they allocate resources in the player coach role. They they do treat management like an like an unpaid internship. I think Co- that's correct. Exact, it's like yeah. when you get done with your work, then you can manage. <laughs> yeah, or or you manage all day long and then you do your work do your at work. home yeah. all night long. You know, uh, yes, exactly. uh, that's that is not that is not sustainable. Uh, yeah. I think also, I mean, the thing that I. Th- that I think they're trying to get at with player coach that that I do think has some merit is that when you become a manager, you shouldn't expect people to do what you say. Right. <laughs> and I think one of the one of the things that ca- that sometimes causes new managers real stress is they become a manager and they expect people to do what they say. And they don't know that telling people what to do doesn't work. And then they feel like either there's something wrong with them or there's something wrong that their, their direct reports are, uh, are, are intransigent or not doing what they say. And, uh, and then they start behaving really stupidly uh, and, and, and being cruel to others. It's the, that's how the sort of brutal incompetence comes into, mm-hmm. <laughs> into management. Like, and, and I think that's true in general in, in life. I mean, the times when I have behaved my worst are those times when I really expected someone to do what I said, to listen to me. And of course they didn't. And then I felt my authority was challenged and like my ego kicked in and I, I did something that I regret. Uh, yeah. So, so I think like teaching people when they become managers, don't expect that people will do what you say because you have this position. I mean, so I think the quote from Bill Clinton is, being the president is an awful lot like being the overseer of a cemetery. There's a lot of people under you, but nobody's listening. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, like... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I ever heard that one. Oh, you haven't heard that one? No. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> that struck me uh, very, I was, when I was managing, I think I was at Juice when he became, when I heard him say I that. I feel like that's how the revolution begins um, it, with the, the, the rising of, from the, <laughs> the cemetery. Jason, I, I uh, say- yeah, what's on your mind? The, the principle of player coach, like to me, the, the reason why the concept is valuable is because we want managers to have good and en- like good enough skills that when the team needs it or an individual needs it, they can kind of roll up their sleeves and, and help. I, I think yeah. the, 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 like it's, it's really important not to lose, um, not, not to lose the ability to like actually do some of the work. You don't need to be able to do ev- literally everything on the team. Like the value of a team is like you can hire specialists who can do things that no one else can do, um, and they yeah. make you better and faster. But like if you if you really are if you if you become allergic to the work, 
you're you're going to be dead in the water because pe- people will sense that you're unwilling and unable to to help. Um, if you do all the work, you will also be in trouble, right? This is the yes. absentee manager versus micromanager yes. uh, dichotomy. But you want to be able to be a thought partner. But sometimes being a thought partner actually means like getting your hands dirty and doing some of the work. Like in order to be a good thought partner, you have to be like down in the muck with the person yeah. and sorting through it to find the brass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have to notice that when they come and talk to you, you help them you know, achieve something that they could otherwise not have achieved or do something faster or they help, you know, and, and you have to know what the work is in order to be able to give that kind of advice as, as a general rule. Yeah. I I would love to get your, your advice on what can people do? And especially whether I am a middle manager or I am, I am in an organization where we are having, we've seen our survey results and, and they're, they're reinforcing what we've just been talking about. So one of the things, again, from this Vizier study, it said, fortunately for employers, quote, only 12% of respondents say that nothing would convince them to become people managers. Unsurprisingly, pay is the primary motivator for respondents, 71% saying better compensation would incentivize them to become people managers. 45% say better benefits and 26% say more opportunities for career advancement. So I know, Kim, we started off with you saying, you know, sort of don't go into it just for the money. But to me, I kind of interpret this more about if this is this unpaid internship and I'm having to do all these other responsibilities that haven't necessarily been explicitly named that that's what people are asking for, that they want to be paid for um, for being both the sort of player and the coach. Is that how you read that? I read that. When, when you were reading that, what I was thinking is people are not explaining what the job is, and therefore people don't want to do it. Um, mm. I mean, I think, like, if you become a lawyer only because you want money, you're not going to be a happy lawyer. I just, I, I think that you need to be able to under, and I think part of the problem with management is either it gets treated like an unpaid internship, or it gets treated as this thing you have to do in order to advance in your career. Mm-hmm. And, and that is, those are both bad reasons to become managers. You become a manager because you want to do the job and you find it exciting and in, to work with a team of people and help them take a step in the direction of their dreams. So do, is it a problem that we, going back to employee ambition, that there's a large number of, you know, number 11 people manager and C-suite executive number 12? Like, is that an alarm bell or is that, what is that signaling? Uh, Kim, as you were, as you were saying that, one of the things that, that it brought up for me is, I think there's organizations and managers are in kind of a double bind that it, that gets created by, you you were talking, Kim, earlier about how at Apple, there was these sort of parallel tracks, right? There's like a technical Mm -hmm. track that you could use to advance in your career. Uh, and then there's this management track. And in my experience, the te- in order to advance in the technical track, it requires, there, there's like hard skills. There's like yeah. the very, 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 very sort of like specific things that you need to be able to do, types of complexity you need to be able to handle and all this other stuff. But before you get to the sort of like the, the staff engineer is like a common title for, for the per- person at the top of that, um, that, that career ladder, but before you get there, there's all these other stages. And it's sort of, in, in some ways, it's, there's almost like an apprenticeship model as you move up, which is like there, there's slow expansion of responsibility. You sort of get bigger scope of projects and things like that. In the management track, there's a step. There's like an individual yeah, it's a zero to one <laughs> to manager. Yeah. Uh, and already you're sort of expected to be able to handle all these things. And, and, and so part of what I hear you saying is, if we're not explaining what the job is, if we're not teaching people how to do the job, like to do the work of being a manager, we are we are creating a. This is the double bind of or, that organizations have created them for themselves. There's no so, sort of like soft on ramp to to management uh, in most organizations, in part because they don't even know what they're asking people to do. So just by defining it mm-hmm. and being clear about it, that would take a step in the right direction. But then, like helping people, training people, finding some way to sort of create that apprenticeship model. Uh, that gets exists in the in technical tracks, 
uh, for a manager might get people more excited. You know what I'm saying? Because right now, yeah. it very much seems like I'm expected to make this sort of step function zero to one change between my current role and a manager. And then I'm kind of, and, and I know all the bad stuff that comes with it, but I don't have the opportunity to experience the really good stuff that comes along with being a manager. And I don't even know what it, what it is, what I have to do. Like you said, you have yeah. to learn hard skills to progress in your technical, on the technical track. I would say you have to learn harder skills to yeah, progress yeah, yeah. as a yeah, manager. Yes, I didn't mean one was easy but and one yes, was hard. Yeah. No, I know. I, no, I know you didn't. <laughs> Just, uh, I, I mean, they're often called soft skills, but, but, but these are really difficult things to learn. Much more difficult, I would argue, than learning, uh, the, than learning a new technical skill. And, and yet, they d- often don't get defined or taught uh, yeah. or valued, especially. And that's why... That's why nobody wants to become a manager because it's like, what, what is the job? Yeah. So in some ways, if we were to go back to the Vizier CEO at, who was making the claim that we need to redefine the role, I think we're making the argument, first, you need to define the role. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. Like, and player coach does not count as defining yeah. the role. Right. So, so step one for organizations who are seeing this as a warning sign, because Amy, to respond to your question specifically, I do think it's like a big blinking red light. Yeah. If people are, if the majority of people who are responding to that survey are saying, I have, I do not see it as like a career objective for me to become a manager. That means that your pool is very small. And if the majority of the people who are putting their hats in the ring are doing it because of the additional money, you're going to be promoting a lot of people who don't who shouldn't be managers in the first place. Like there's just no Who, no who don't way. want the job, yeah. Right, who, who, who don't want the job. So step one is defining the role. And I think step two is like giving a, people a way to experience the great parts of management, like the exciting part of, you know, helping. So a concrete example of this might be a buddy or mentorship program. A buddy or mentorship program is a great way to give people a taste of what it's like to be a manager, right? The sort yeah. of like coaching and developing somebody else. It, they're proven to be really good for retention, meaning like they're they're great programs for for retaining the talent that you hire, and it gives you a taste of like you know if I was doing this for four or five or six people, would that be the, a great? Would I consider that to be a great way to spend you know a significant time. chunk of my time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. In in the military, that's called the non commissioned officer, right? The someone who has been in your job is no longer doing your job is like writing along with you and teaching you how to do the job. Yep. Uh, I think most most companies can't afford to hire a manager to teach a manager, but it would be great if they could. I think that's great. And I, I really appreciate the tips, Jason. I think you just gave us our, our tips. Before we close, Kim, I want to go back to uh, when you were at Apple and the guy who said, uh, you know, this is the work that I want to do and I want to get paid for this work. I'm curious... Was there an example that you had in your own career, whether at Apple or somewhere else, where you did you saw what it was like to be a manager and that inspired you? Like what would have been the inspirational either mentor or conversation that you were like, oh, okay, this is something that is actually really interesting yeah. for me? When when I was working in Moscow for this diamond company, and I had no interest in diamonds, like I wound up there in a random way, I had a boss who would call me first thing in the morning and just ask me what was going on. And I like really enjoyed talking to him. And I realized that his job was to like help me feel more comfortable and free to do my job. And I was like, oh, that's kind of fun. So that was like, that was one moment where I sort of, I remember feeling like, oh, I could have an interesting career doing what he's doing. And then Mm -hmm. there was another, there was another moment at business school when we were doing the case on the Tylenol poisoning and the Credo challenge. And the new CEO of Tylenol in 1976 or whatever. Uh, J&J? Yeah. Oh, J&J. Yes, sorry. Um, spent a bunch of time uh, working with his team to rewrite the credo. Like he spent his first five months as CEO traveling around the world and, and rewriting the credo. And I remember thinking, that's what CEOs do? I could do that. Would be, that yeah. sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so those are my two stories about the time he credited the, the company's ability to respond so well to the poisoning with having spent those five months rewriting the credo because people really knew what was important. There's something so powerful about getting people, the feeling of like getting people aligned. It feels so expensive that the sort of like process of, of painting a picture of like what the future could look like. Um, and it can be really frustrating because people disagree. Like they naturally disagree about what the future could or should should look like. And then I, I think it was very wise, you know, it might also have been sort of self uh, self-congratulatory, but also very wise to like credit the team's ability to sort of follow the credo that they had just themselves created. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, as like uh, giving that the credit for successfully navigating that challenge. Because I do think like that, that is one of the moments uh, where it actually feels good to be in leadership. It feels good that there, there's like this powerful, almost like feeling, I'm trying to think like, how do I want to say this? You said earlier, Kim, that you can't tell people what to do. So you can't tell people these are the things that are important, and you must think that these things are important. Yes. You must follow the like. And so instead, he drew out like this process through this process drew out the things that were really important. And then when crisis came, people were able to follow to do the right thing. Yeah, to do yeah. to do the right thing, and that's a rarefied experience. You know, mo very, very rarely do people get, get to experience something like that. And I do think that that, that is having those examples is, is something that maybe the world needs more of. Maybe there's a book of inspiring leadership stories, and, those moments of exaltation. <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes it doesn't have to be even, like I remember there was one point where a, a woman on my team had gone I think she was ill. So she was out for several months and then she came back and we were having a big debate about something, a big, you know, discussion. And there was a lot of disagreement, but it was a fun conversation. And I remember at the end of the conversation, she was like, oh, I missed this. I'm so glad to be back. And that was like, that, that was fuel for a year. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's just that feeling of, oh, I like working with you people and we're getting somewhere. Um, yeah. that is, that is like, that's really joyful. Or when you work with someone who, uh, who all of a sudden is doing something that they always wanted to do, but thought they never could do, uh, like yeah. that is, that is incredibly satisfying for me. Like that's the most satisfying thing that can happen in a career. And that's why I liked being a manager. Kim, that reminds me of a story in my career when I was was managing someone and they were new to the role and had come from a more corporate background and so and they were responsible for design and I kept encouraging them to, you know, you can be more creative and showing them different examples but I would keep getting back these more sort of corporate stayed designs and I kept yeah. trying to paint a picture of what was possible and it was sort of we're going back and forth and then kind of a few weeks in all of a sudden all this creativity came out and it was it was that sense of like that unlocking and yeah. and sometimes you don't know what's that thing that's going to help unlock that other person and some of it's patient and some of it's painting a picture and some of it's just them all of a sudden realizing that something new was possible so i share with you um i hadn't thought of that in a while and i think just to jason's point like it doesn't have to be these huge stories of like we overcame you know the johnson and johnson crisis like th those can be really powerful but even in some of our day to day moments that it does give you some of that energy uh, to keep to keep moving forward. In fact, maybe our listeners can write us, what's that moment of joy in being a manager? And maybe we'll read some of these out. These can be some of our favorite things. I would love to hear Oh, from I people. love that idea. Yeah. I think uh, we want to give uh, being a manager a little better PR. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and, and first, yes. as Jason said, defining it. Yes, exactly. All right. So just to revisit quickly our radical candor checklist, these are tips to start putting radical candor into practice. Tip number one, define the role. Teach people what the job of management is. What do they do? And provide the training and resources to help them learn how to do it better. Tip number two, create a buddy or mentorship program so people interested in people management can experience some of the positive aspects of building relationships, guiding teams to achieve results, and helping people take steps in the direction of their dreams. 
Tip number three, if you want to explore this topic further, listen to season five, episode 25, Should I Be a Manager? And season six, episode two, Managers Are Burned Out Too, to find out more. And for other tips, you can go check out our YouTube channel where you can not only listen to this podcast, but also watch dozens of other Radical Candor videos. Show notes for this episode are at radicalcandor.com slash podcast praise in public and private. And of course, you can go ahead and criticize in private. So if you like what you hear, go ahead, rate and review us wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you have criticism for us or your stories of manager joy, email it to podcast, P-O-D-C-A-S-T at radicalcandor.com. Bye for now. Bye everyone. Take care. The Radical Candor Podcast is based on the book, Radical Candor, Be a Kick-Ass Boss Without Losing Your Humanity by Kim Scott. Episodes are written and produced by Brandy Neal with script editing by me, Amy Sandler. The show features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff and is hosted by me, still Amy Sandler. Nick Carissimi is our audio engineer. The Radical Candor Podcast theme music was composed by Cliff Goldmacher. Follow us on LinkedIn, Radical Candor the Company, and visit us at RadicalCandor.com. 